That bottle of vitamin D3 and K2 on your kitchen counter. Do you ever wonder if you're using the right ratio? You know you need both, but the question lingers. How much K2 do you actually need for every 5,000 I Q of D3? If you get the ratio wrong, is it unsafe or just a waste of money? If that uncertainty sounds familiar, today we're going to turn it into confidence. Together, we'll uncover the safe, science-backed ratio and explore why this balance is so incredibly important for your bone and heart health. And be sure to stay tuned, because there's a third, often overlooked mineral that without it, even the perfect ratio might not work effectively. If this kind of straightforward health talk is what you need, please take a moment to hit that like button and subscribe. Your support truly helps us continue this work. All right, let's get started. To make this really hit home, we're going to follow our friend, Robert. At 67, Robert is a retired engineer who likes things to be precise. His doctor started him on 5000 IU of D3, and he added K2 on his own. Now, he's determined to figure out the perfect specs. His story will be our guide. Number 1. The Critical Partnership Why D3 Needs a Co-Pilot Before we can talk about how much, we have to understand why. Why is this pairing so important? Robert initially thought vitamin D3 was just for his bones. His doctor told him so. And that's true, but it's only half the story. Think of vitamin D3 as a highly effective gatekeeper. When you take D3, it goes to your intestines and opens a big gate, allowing calcium from the food you eat to flood into your bloodstream. Its job is simple, to raise your blood calcium levels. At first, Robert thought, great, more calcium in my blood means more calcium for my bones. But then he realized a disturbing problem. Vitamin D3, the gatekeeper, doesn't care where the calcium goes after it's in the blood. It only completes one mission, get calcium into the body. That extra calcium could end up in places you absolutely don't want it, like the walls of your arteries, causing arterial calcification. Picture your arteries like flexible rubber hoses when you were young. Arterial calcification is like calcium slowly seeping into that rubber making it hard and brittle like an old plastic pipe. When arteries get stiff, they can't expand and contract well, leading to high blood pressure and dramatically increasing the risk of heart attack and stroke. This is where vitamin K2 comes in. If vitamin D3 is the gatekeeper, vitamin K2 is the traffic director. It doesn't just stand there and wave. It activates two specific proteins that act like professional workers. One protein goes to the artery walls and acts as a security guard, preventing calcium from parking and settling there. The second protein acts like a construction foreman, collecting the calcium floating in the blood and safely transporting it to where it belongs, your bones and teeth. The proof for this isn't just theory. A large and famous observational study called the Rotterdam Study, which followed thousands of older adults in the Netherlands for a decade, found a stunning result. Those who consumed the most vitamin K2 in their diet had a 7% lower risk of dying from heart disease and significantly less severe arterial calcification. In other words, this study proved that the traffic director isn't just a nice idea, it's a lifesaver. When Robert understood this, a light bulb went on in his head. Taking high-dose vitamin D3 without enough vitamin K2 is like opening all the gates to a major city during rush hour with no traffic cops. The result is chaos. He realized this wasn't just about taking two good vitamins, 
it was about creating a system of safety. Has this interaction ever been explained to you this way? Does understanding K2's traffic director role help you see why the balance is so critical? Number 2. The Vitamin D3 Foundation Why 5000 IU? The question in our title is about pairing K2 with 5000 IU of D3. But why that number? Robert's doctor prescribed that dose based on his blood test, which showed his level was 25 nanograms per milliliter. His doctor explained that while the normal lab range might start at 30, many experts in functional and anti-aging medicine now believe the optimal range for disease prevention is between 50 and 90. Nanograms per milliliter. Think of it like a gas tank. A level of 30 is like the needle being on E for empty. You might still run for a bit, but it's not safe. A level of 50 to 90 is like having a full tank, allowing your engine to run at peak performance. For older adults, getting to that optimal level from sun alone is very difficult. There are three main reasons. First, as we age, the vitamin D-making factory in our skin becomes less efficient. A 70-year-old skin produces about 75% less vitamin D than a 20-year-old's from the same amount of sun exposure. That factory has simply slowed down over time. Second, many of us live in northern latitudes, like Chicago or Boston, where the angle of the sun in the winter is too low for UVB rays to penetrate the atmosphere and create vitamin D. During those months, your vitamin D production switch is essentially turned off. Third, we spend more time indoors and responsibly wear sunscreen to prevent skin cancer, which also blocks vitamin D production. For these reasons, for many older adults with low initial levels, a dose of 5,000 IU per day is an effective, well-studied dose to safely raise their blood levels into that optimal range. Robert felt confident that the D3 part of his equation was solid and evidence-based. Now, he needed to figure out the dose for its partner. Have you ever had your vitamin D level checked? If you feel comfortable, share in the comments what dose you're taking. Your experience could help someone else. Number three, the golden ratio, the number for vitamin K2. All right, here's the million dollar question. Robert has his 5,000 IU of D3. How much K2 does he need to effectively direct traffic? When he dug into the scientific research, a general rule of thumb began to emerge. This ratio isn't a rigid FDA mandate, but rather a consensus drawn from interpreting clinical data and the work of leading researchers in the field. A widely accepted safe and effective starting ratio is, for every 5,000 to 10,000 IU of vitamin D3, you should aim for about 100 to 200 micrograms MCG of vitamin K2. A microgram is a very small unit, one thousandth of a milligram, so don't confuse the two. So for Robert's 5,000 IU dose of D3, taking a 100 mcg capsule of K2 daily would be an excellent starting point. But then Robert noticed something else on the K2 label. It said MK7. Vitamin K2 comes in two main forms. MK4 and MK7. MK4 is effective, and it's the form used in many osteoporosis studies in Japan, often at very high doses. However, it's like a sprinter. It works fast, but also disappears from the body quickly. To maintain its effect, you often have to take it multiple times a day. MK7 is derived from fermented foods, and is like a marathon runner. It stays in your blood for a much longer time. This makes it ideal for once-a-day supplementation. For Robert, who likes simplicity, 
choosing a K2 supplement in the MK7 form made sense. 1100 MCG MK7 capsule a day with his 5000 IU of D3 became his golden ratio. It provided the assurance that the traffic director was always on duty. Does understanding the difference between MK4 and MK7 help you when you're looking at supplement labels? Sometimes these little details make a big difference. Number 4. The Calcium Question. Is more always better? Now that Robert had his D3 and K2 ratio, he started thinking about calcium. He looked at a large bottle of calcium supplements he'd been taking for years. The question popped into his head. If I'm doing all this to get calcium into my bones, maybe I should be taking even more calcium. This is a dangerous thought trap. The problem for most older adults in America isn't a lack of calcium, but that the calcium is going to the wrong places. Taking a high-dose calcium pill without enough K2 is like having a giant dump truck deliver bricks to a construction site with no supervisor. The bricks get dumped everywhere, in this case, in your arteries. This isn't just a theory. Major studies, including a meta-analysis published in the prestigious British medical journal, BMJ, have linked high-dose calcium supplementation, typically 1,000 milliwigwigs or more from pills, to an increased risk of heart attack. When Robert understood this, he made a crucial decision. He decided to stop taking his high-dose calcium supplement. Instead, he focused on getting his calcium from whole food sources like yogurt, cheese, sardines, and dark leafy greens. He realized that calcium from food comes in a natural package with other minerals that help the body use it properly, unlike a large, isolated dose from a pill. He trusted his D3 and K2 duo to take the calcium from those foods and make sure it got to the right place. What are your thoughts on calcium supplements? It's a topic with a lot of conflicting information, and sharing what you've learned can help others. Number 5. The Silent Partner the Forgotten Companion Robert felt he had a nearly perfect system, but there was one final piece, a critical character working behind the scenes. That character is magnesium. This is a scientific fact that even many doctors overlook. Every single enzyme in your body needed to metabolize and activate vitamin D is magnesium-dependent. Imagine this. When you take vitamin D3, it's in an inactive form, like a car with no key in the ignition. For it to work, it has to go through a two-step process in the liver and kidneys. Magnesium is like the key and the spark plug that powers the engine at both of those steps. Without the key, the car isn't going anywhere, no matter how much gas you put in it. In fact, a review published in the Journal of the American Osteopathic Association went so far as to say that ensuring adequate magnesium is essential when correcting vitamin D levels, calling it a critical piece of the puzzle. If you are deficient in magnesium, which research shows over half the U.S. population is, it doesn't matter how much D3 you take. It will just float around in your body, unactivated. When Robert learned this, it was the final aha moment. He realized his system wasn't a duo, but a trio. He went to the health food store and bought a bottle of magnesium glycinate. Not only did adding magnesium ensure his D3 was working effectively, but he also noticed he was sleeping much better. Are you taking magnesium with your D3 and K2? It's a crucial piece that's often overlooked. Number six, putting it all together. Robert's daily routine. So, after all this research, what did Robert's daily routine look like? It went from confusion 
to a simple, confident, systematic process. In the morning, with a breakfast that contains some healthy fat, like avocado or eggs, one 5,000 IU capsule of vitamin D3, one 100 MCG capsule of vitamin K2, as MK7. Note, he takes them with fat because both are fat-soluble vitamins, meaning they need fat to be absorbed properly. Throughout the day, he focuses on eating calcium-rich foods like Greek yogurt, a little cheese, and spinach in his salad. In the evening, about an hour before bed, a dose of magnesium glycinate. Note, he takes it in the evening because the glycinate form has a calming effect on the nervous system and can promote better sleep. That's it. A simple routine, but every component has a clear purpose, working in harmony. He's no longer just taking pills. He's managing a system designed to optimize his bone and heart health. Does seeing a routine laid out so clearly help you picture how you could apply this to your own life? We started with Robert, standing in his kitchen confused. And we end with Robert, who has a confident, evidence-based routine. He learned that D3 is the gatekeeper, K2 is the traffic director, and magnesium is the ignition key. He learned the golden ratio, about 100 to 200 micrograms of K2 for every 5,000 IU of D3. And he learned that getting calcium from food is often safer and more effective than taking high-dose pills. This story isn't just about vitamins. It's about shifting from being a passive recipient of health advice to being an active, informed participant. Now it's your turn. What part of Robert's journey resonated most with you? Was it the traffic director metaphor or the overlooked role of magnesium? What's one small adjustment to your own routine you feel you can make after watching this? And before we sign off, I want to give a special thank you to those of you who have stayed with me until the very end. Your focus and commitment to your health are truly inspiring. To let me know you're one of those dedicated companions, would you please do me a favor and leave a simple comment with just the number one? It will be our little signal, and it means the world to me to know you've completed this entire journey with me. If this video brought you the clarity you were looking for, please hit that like button and share it with a friend who you know might also be standing in front of their medicine cabinet feeling confused. And don't forget to subscribe for more straightforward, helpful advice. Remember, you are fully capable of understanding and managing your health. You can be the engineer of your own body. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.